Hello, everyone, and wel- welcome to Ask Concussion Dog, episode number 106. Uh, I've been away for a few weeks, and uh, we were trying to sell our house, so we had to be out of here, and thankfully, we did. So I'm back in the saddle, as they say. Uh, so this particular episode is a doozy. Uh, I have over 10 pages of notes for this particular episode, so I think that it's going to be an interesting one. It's going to be, it's going to answer a lot of questions for a lot of people. And uh, the episode title is called "What to Do If You've Just Had Your First Concussion." Um, so. <laughs> I'm going to break things down from what is a concussion, how to recognize the signs and symptoms, what to do right off the bat, when you should be starting physio. Somebody just asked me that on the live session. Um, And then I'm going to break down the research for some of the things um, that can cause prolonged outcomes after concussion and what things you can do to mitigate those very same things. Because if you can mitigate those issues, the recovery uh, will be much, much, much better than if you are unable to mitigate those things. So concussion can be something that for some people is just a mere, you know, three, four, five days worth of symptoms. For other people, it's completely life altering and can take months to years to recover. And so in this episode, I'm going to break all that down and give you the kind of playbook um, that you would need in, in order to get better quickly Um, The good news is that we are learning that a lot of these things can be actually fixed, treated right off the bat, and because of that, we can actually significantly reduce the chances of having prolonged outcomes. So like I said, I have 10 pages worth of notes to go on here, so uh, here we go. So these are things that we've been teaching our clinicians at Complete Concussion Management Clinics for the past 10 years or so now, and um, here's the stats. So if you just leave somebody with a concussion to their own devices, meaning that if they get an injury and a lot of the studies that are done this way, you get an injury, come into the emergency department, they put you into a study and then they just follow you. They don't give you really any advice. They might give you a take home sheet or something like that, but then they'll call you, um, you know, a few weeks later just to ask, are you still experiencing symptoms? And then from that, we'll start to have an idea around how many people have prolonged symptoms. Now the definition for post-concussion syndrome based on the international classification of diseases is having three or more symptoms beyond four weeks after injury. Okay, three or more symptoms beyond four weeks after injury. The studies that have been done in both children and adults have found that the on average about 30 to 40 percent of all concussion patients will continue to have prolonged or persistent symptoms beyond a four week period. Okay. 30 to 40%. So we used to say that all oh, most concussions are going to recover, uh, you know, within a couple weeks, that is still somewhat true, but the number is getting smaller and smaller. More and more people are starting to have prolonged symptoms. So 30 to 40%, all right, 30 to 40%. That means that about 60 to 70% of people are going to recover without issue. Within the first month, you're going to have all your symptoms gone and that'll be great. But 30 to 40% will not have that. Now, to kind of flip this a little bit, at complete concussion management clinics, where we have trained professionals, less than 5% of the patients that we see, if we see you within the first uh, seven to 10 days after injury, only 5% or less of people will go on to have persistent concussion symptoms at a month. So this just shows you how treatable and how, um, how preventable this particular thing is. Okay. So if we just leave you to do whatever you want, 30 to 40% of you are going to have symptoms after a month. If we actually do the right things, less than 5% are going to have symptoms after one month. So like can cut, like many, many other injuries, what you do in the very early days after that injury is going to make all the difference. Unfortunately, most concussion patients and many of you that are watching this right now live or on YouTube or listening to this uh, via podcast can probably attest to the fact that you didn't realize what you should be doing until it was actually too late. So the 
effort that we are trying to put forward here is that hopefully somebody will hear this in the very early days of their concussion injury. Maybe somebody will forward it to them and they'll find it on YouTube when they search for it. And hopefully this will make a difference in their recovery. And I really hope it does. But also if you are watching this and you are a PCS patient already and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm too late. That's not true. The good news is that a lot of the treatments that I'm going to talk about in the early days are also important in the PCS phase. So if you've already gone on to have persistent symptoms, that's okay. It's still treatable. It's harder to treat, right? The longer it's been, the more difficult it is, but it is still considered a treatable condition. You just have to have the right approach and the right team to help you out. Okay. So it's not too late, no matter how long it's been. All right. First off, let's talk very, very basic things. Let's talk about what a concussion is. A concussion is a traumatic brain injury, otherwise known as a TBI, okay? There are three classifications of TBI. You have mild, moderate, and severe. Concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. Now, the classification of brain injury is based on things like the Glasgow Coma Scale score, which in concussion, it can be fully alert, or down to a score of 13. So it's between 13 and 15 on the Glasgow Coma Scale. Loss of consciousness, there may be no loss of consciousness, or you could have a loss of consciousness up to 30 minutes. If the loss of consciousness is longer than 30 minutes, now you're into moderate traumatic brain injury. So concussion, loss of consciousness is less than 30 minutes, and it may be zero. Oftentimes, less than 10% of patients actually have a loss of consciousness when they get a concussion. So a lot of times patients will be told, well, if you didn't lose consciousness or you didn't get knocked out, you didn't have a concussion. That is not true, right? 90% of concussions do not result in a loss of consciousness. Post-traumatic amnesia, this is mean the inability to form new memories. So this means that somebody who, you know, gets hit and then they keep asking, where are we? Why are we here? What happened? And they can't, and you tell them, you know, you're here because you had a hit and, you know, you're having some issues and we're at the hospital. Oh, Okay. And then five minutes later, they'll ask you the same question. What, what are we doing here? Why are we here? Right? That's post-traumatic amnesia. So with concussion, they can have none of that, or they can have that for up to 24 hours. Once they go beyond 24 hours, again, they're into moderate traumatic brain injury territory. So concussion is defined as this very narrow window from being pretty much clinically looking fairly normal, right? No loss of consciousness, no post-traumatic amnesia, up to a period of loss of consciousness of half an hour or uh, post-traumatic amnesia up to 24 hours or less, or Glasgow Coma Scale may be full, they might be fully alert, everything looks and seems fine, or they may have some mild confusion, some slurred speech, some things like that. So 13 to 15 on the Glasgow Coma Scale. Concussion is a functional injury, which means that your, your, your imaging is going to be normal. So any MRIs, any CAT scans, anything like that is going to be normal in the majority of cases. Sometimes they will still do imaging at the hospital because they're concerned that there may be a bleed, which is something in addition to concussion that's more serious. And so they have criteria, things that they would pick up on during their assessment that might lead them to believe that, you know what, there could be a bleed here. I am going to put this person into a CT scan just to see if there's a bleed, okay? So the CT scan itself can't pick up Concussion, because concussion doesn't cause observable damage to the brain. These imaging techniques are what we call structural imaging techniques. They can look at the structure of the brain, but concussion doesn't damage the structure of the brain. Everything is intact. It looks normal, right? So that's why concussion is so difficult. Concussion is a functional injury. It changes how the brain functions, which we can't pick up on any of these imaging modalities. Concussion is due to acceleration. So what I will say, and I have said this before, is concussion is not caused by hits to the head, right? Hits to the head aren't what causes concussion. It's acceleration of the brain that leads to concussion injury. So if you get hit in the head or if you bump your head on a countertop or anything, that doesn't really necessarily mean that you've had a concussion. Concussion comes from the boom acceleration and the brain moving inside the head. So in order to get a concussion, you have to have enough force to significantly jostle the head around and move it so that the brain is moving inside the skull, right? It's not the hit to the head that's going to do it. So people that, you know, bump their head on a countertop or things like that and think they have a concussion, 
Very rarely would that cause a concussion injury, right? You need to have significant motion, acceleration, and deceleration of the brain to actually result in a concussion injury. Because what it does is it causes a stretching of the brain cells. So as the brain cells get stretched, they don't rip, they don't break, they don't do anything like that. They stretch. And then upon that stretching, what happens is there's a chemical exchange and that chemical exchange causes the brain to become excited. And that excitation is what causes the concussion signs and symptoms, right? The brain cells are going berserk and all this firing is happening within the brain. Your brain system is uh, electrical. So it's chemical and it's electrical. Chemical signals cross over different barriers and they cause the brain signals to either turn on or turn off. And when they turn on, that's an excitation. And when they turn off, it's called inhibition. So what happens in this scenario is the brain gets stretched. That stretching creates this chemical exchange. That chemical exchange causes millions of brain cells all at the same time to undergo an excitatory phase. So they all start to fire and discharge. So you have this electrical storm that happens in the brain. Normally, your nervous system is very um, um, organized. It, things go in the right direction, the right pathway. It all makes sense. But when everything is happening at the same time, it is not organized anymore. It's more chaos. And that chaos can cause any number of signs and symptoms after concussion. So people might be off balance. People might be confused. It's because there's so much going on, right? And we'll talk about that when we get into the signs of concussion, things you can observably see. It makes sense when you think about what's actually going on inside the brain. So what happens after that excitatory part of concussion is it changes how the brain metabolizes, produces, and uses energy, all right? The energy molecule that we use is called ATP. Concussion actually affects the brain cell's ability to produce ATP. So concussion is what's called a metabolic injury because the, the, the production and use of energy is called metabolism. And concussion affects our brain cells' ability to create and use energy. So it's a metabolic injury. But it's a short-term metabolic injury. All right? Okay. We're getting deep here. We're getting deep here. So the net result after concussion is an energy deficit within the cells of the brain. This is very short term, however. The evidence on this shows that in humans, this lasts between three and four weeks, up to, in some studies, up to six weeks. But mo the majority of evidence points to about a three to four week recovery for the energy stores to come back online, where you start producing energy in a more efficient way, and you start using it in a more efficient way, and you're kind of back to, you know, kind of a baseline or pre-injury level after the injury. It's all the other things that happen in, in accordance or in conjunction with that initial injury that can cause persistent symptoms in some patients. But all of these things, if you tackle them right away, you can actually affect change and prevent this stuff from happening. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So what are the signs of concussions? Well, a sign is something that somebody sees. It's what an outside observer might see. All right. Concussion, there's distinct things. If you think about what's going on in the brain, right, you have this electrical storm going on in the brain. Other things that are associated with an electrical storm would be something like a seizure. Well, in some patients after concussions, they will actually go into a seizure. This is a sign that there's this electrical storm going on inside the brain. Other signs of concussion, loss of consciousness, right? Too much activity and person goes unconscious. Seizures, like I said, tonic posturing or what's called a fencing response, loss of balance, incoordination, right? If you think about this, this chaos going on, the person's trying to navigate their environment and they can't because what they think is the ground is not the ground and they're getting mixed messages. And so they can't, their brain can't sort out what's real and what's just been fabricated by this electrical storm that's going on. And so everything kind of gets thrown out the window. So in coordination, slow or labored movements, confusion. Sometimes you'll see a player get up and completely go the wrong direction in a game. They don't know what's going on. That is confusion. Blank or vacant stares, right? There's another type of seizure that used to be called petite mal seizure. It's now called an absence seizure. But this is somebody just having a blank or vacant stare. They're just kind of staring off into space, right? There's a lot of, a lot of things going on. 
and they can't really process what you're asking them. Uh, they may clutch their head in pain after they get hit, just indicating that there's uh, some pain that's happening there. Slurring of the speech or using inappropriate words, being very emotional, right? So having an emotional outburst, crying, um, sobbing, um, uncharacteristic of the individual. Irritability, uh, drowsy or sleepy. This is more of an after effect. You don't see this right away. Usually you see this a few hours after the injury because this electrical chaos it burns a lot of energy. And then the second phase of concussion is what we call spreading depression, where our cells are now not producing energy to the same degree, and we start to actually have this drop in energy, and the person starts getting very fatigued, very sleepy, they'll want to go to sleep, um, and that is that. So those are the signs that somebody may have had a concussion. So if you're an outside observer and you're picking up any of these signs, um, you should be definitely thinking that a concussion has occurred, okay? Um, there was a study that was recently done by Davis and colleagues in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and they developed an international consensus criteria for what they call uh, video observable signs. Now, this is for professional sports, because now in professional sports, they have concussion spotters, right? So these are paid individuals, usually, you know, physicians or um, other healthcare providers that will sit in the stands and be responsible for picking up some of these objective signs. So if somebody gets hit and they're clutching their head, if somebody's off balance or whatever, the concussion spotter will call down and have that player removed for assessment. Now, some of the things that they're looking for, they had this consensus meeting to try and come up with what are the most reliable indicators that a concussion may have occurred. And so they came up with six ones so these are these are the ones that the experts agreed on are the most um, are the most beneficial or the most um, uh, indicative that a concussion has occurred okay so lying motionless after impact motor in coordination right so this might be off balance or things like that uh, impact seizure so if the person gets hit and does have a seizure right electrical storm makes sense tonic posturing which is again that kind of fencing response you often see this in uh, mixed martial arts or even football where the person gets hit and their arms are in this rigid position up in the air and then they gradually kind of fall down. So in a, in a fighter, they may get you know hit and they go unconscious and they fall to the mat and they kind of maintain that fighting position. So that, that's called a fencing response, uh, and that is also known as tonic posturing. Uh, no protective action, meaning that they get hit and they fall and they don't even try to protect themselves, right? They just Boom, head hits ground. That is indication that there's been a loss of consciousness because normally people would protect themselves. Uh, and so if you see that from the sidelines, then that would be indicative of a concussion and a blank or vacant look on the face. And if you've ever seen somebody with a concussion, they have this kind of just glassed over look. It's it's like nobody's home is, is kind of the, the uh, you know, the way to put it, I guess, is you're talking to somebody, they're just kind of, eh, they're, they're not there. Okay, so those are the signs of a concussion. Those are the most common ones, the most agreed upon ones. But if you think about what's going on in the brain, it all makes sense, right? Electrical storm, chaos, not making sense of the information coming in, unable to navigate the environment or interact with people. So when you try to talk to them, they are not able to respond in a way that would be um, you know, appropriate. All right, next up, what are the symptoms of a concussion? So the signs are something you can see the symptoms are something you can feel. Now, not everybody will have signs of a concussion, right? Loss of consciousness, like I said, happens in less than 10% of people, right? Seizures is even more rare. You might see that in less than 1% of people. So you're not always going to see something that would point to a concussion, which means we have to rely on symptoms. The problem with symptoms is that they're based on the person being honest. They have to tell us that they are experiencing symptoms because if they aren't able to tell us that, right, and if they don't want to tell us that, particularly around sport when they're worried that they might get pulled off uh, or have to forfeit a match or, 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 or something like that, they may be less likely to tell us. So these are subjective. So signs are something that are objective that you can see, symptoms, something that somebody feels. And the most popular list of concussion symptoms comes from the SCAT-5. And they are usually rated from zero to six um, in terms of severity. So zero means none at all. Six means that's the most severe that someone could ever, you know, kind of have or imagine. And they are headache, 
pressure in the head, neck pain, nauseousness or vomiting, dizziness, blurred vision, balance problems, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise, feeling slowed down, feelings of fogginess, not feeling right or not feeling like yourself, uh, difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering, uh, fatigue or low energy, confusion, drowsiness, more emotional, irritability, sadness, nervous or anxious, trouble falling asleep um, if they have actually tried to fall asleep. Um, so those are the symptoms of concussion. Those are self-reported. And usually when we do an assessment on somebody, they're self-rated. So we say headache, zero to six, give us a rating scale. And they will give us a rating scale in terms of the severity of that. All right. So the question that we get often, and we see this often when people are Googling or searching things is how do you know if you have a concussion? So this is something that people are always confused by. How do I know if I have a concussion? The diagnostic criteria for concussion is actually pretty loose. So you need two things. You only need two things to be true in order to consider the injury a concussion injury. Number one, there has to have been a mechanism of injury. And the mechanism of injury that we're concerned with here is a significant acceleration or deceleration of the head. Because like I said, just because somebody got a little bump in the head, just because you hit your head doesn't mean that you've had a significant impact. You need a good acceleration so that the brain is actually jostling around inside of the skull. That's what can causes, that's what causes concussion. So you need a significant acceleration or deceleration to the head. You don't need to be hit in the head even. If you get hit in the body, like if let's say you're playing rugby and somebody tackles you and you, and you fly back and your, your head doesn't hit anything that can still cause a concussion because it's the acceleration deceleration of the brain inside the skull that leads to the concussion injury. So you need two things. I said one is a mechanism of injury and number two, you need signs or symptoms of concussion to occur immediately after or within a few hours after. Sometimes it can be a slight delay in the onset of symptoms. Okay. And you only need one sign or symptom. So this is kind of the thing. The diagnostic criteria, like I said, is pretty loose, pretty easy to fall into the, into the category of concussion. If you have a mechanism of injury, meaning some sort of acceleration, deceleration impact to the head, and you have a sign or symptom, just one, immediately after or shortly thereafter, concussion should be top on your list. It basically should be treated as a concussion because there's no way to rule a concussion out and there's no way to rule it in. So oftentimes people will say, well, how can I confirm? Can you do some testing on me to confirm that a concussion has occurred? And the answer is actually no. Like I said previously, imaging can't see a concussion because a concussion is a change in how the brain functions. Your, none of these other tests can do this. EEG can't do this yet. There's a bunch of new technologies coming out trying to do this. You can't do it yet. Blood tests, there is no blood test for a concussion despite what the media is having people believe. The blood tests that we do have are, are used to detect brain bleeds, not concussions. So they're using the emergency department to say who has a brain bleed so that we don't have to image everybody. We can only image those people with brain bleeds to actually see it. So the blood tests for concussion are not actually for concussion. Now this is a misnomer. Okay. So how can we confirm the injury? You can't. And that's the tricky part about concussion. So really what I'm saying here is that if you have a mechanism of injury and you have one sign or symptom of a concussion that occurs um, immediately after or shortly after, then you should be considering that to be a concussion and you should be seeking out the care of a trained concussion clinician to handle that issue. It may be a doctor, it may be somebody else, it may be a physio, it may be a chiropractor, maybe an athletic therapist, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that it should be somebody with training and concussion. That's the most important thing. And I'm going to talk about that as we get a little bit further down my 10 page list here. By the way, I'm at the bottom of page four right now. So this is how much more we have to go. Um, so um, how long does a concussion last? Now, here's where we get into the meat and potatoes of this. This is dependent on a variety of factors. Okay. How long does a concussion last is a very, very big question. Like I said, for 60 to 70% of the population that gets a concussion, it's going to be gone within about a month or so. For 30 to 40% of the population, it's going to be longer than a month. 
and it could be months and it could be years okay but the good news is is if you're in to see somebody right away we can actually prevent that from happening in the first place so here we go with no treatment between 30 to 40 percent of patients that are going to have symptoms beyond one month so for the most part if you want to say this, for the most people, concussion is going to recover within about a month. But here are some things that are associated with prolonged recovery. If we understand things that are associated with prolonged recovery, we can put a stop to it. Number one, continuing to play in the same game after a concussion has occurred. So there's been several studies on this topic that have found that those players that are removed right away, immediately after the injury, and they're not allowed to go back and play, they always do significantly better in terms of recovery time than those individuals that continue to play. And actually, recently, there was a dose response that was found to this, meaning that not only if you continue to play, but the length of time that you continued to play after injury had a significant impact on your recovery. So listen to this. Study found in the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation, and the main author is Sherrick. Um, adolescent athletes who continued to play for 15 minutes or less, so very short period of time, right? They got hit, played for 15 minutes or less after the injury, had a, they were five and a half times more likely to experience the prolonged recovery versus those who were removed right away. Okay, five and a half times more likely if they played for as little as 15 minutes after the injury occurred. Um, those who played for 15 minutes or longer were 11.76 times more likely to have a prolonged recovery versus those who were removed immediately. So the lesson here for all of you athletes watching that think that just because you had a concussion, oh, it's okay, I'm just going to play this game and then I'm going to sit out the next one. No, 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 no. It matters how quickly you come off the field. So the, the, the lesson is come off right away because you'll actually get back to the sport sooner than if you continue to play in that same game. So those 15 minutes are going to potentially cost you weeks in terms of your recovery time, all right? So it matters. So that's number one. Continue to play in the same game after concussion has occurred is a risk factor for having prolonged outcomes. Being female, and sorry, some of these you can't control, obviously. Being female, females are not only one and a half times to two times more likely to get concussed while playing comparable sports. So if you play a sport that involves non-contact for both sexes so for example you have um you know basketball basketball is the same sport whether you're male or female females will be one and a half to two times more likely to get concussed in basketball than men will same thing with soccer right and if you look at sports that are not sex comparable like something like ice hockey ice hockey in males is full contact ice hockey in females is non-contact yet the concussion rates are the same Okay, so in sports where the, the there's contact or non-contact in both females are one and a half to two and a half or two times more likely to get concussed playing a comparable sport. Females are also shown to take longer to recover. This has been shown in both adolescents and in adults. A study by uh, Roger Zemeck's group out of Ottawa um, actually developed a clinical prediction rule for concussion recovery. So what a clinical prediction rule is, is they take all these different variables and they try to see what's associated with prolonged recovery. And then they try to develop this point system where the more points that somebody has, so if I have somebody come into my office and I do this assessment on them and I assign points for each of these variables, I'll end up with a score. The higher that score is, the longer uh, or the, the, the longer or the more likely they are to have a prolonged recovery. The lower that score, the less likely they are to have a prolonged recovery. And as part of their model, being male was associated with a score of zero. Being female, they automatically added two points to your score. Okay? So females tend to take longer to recover. And we don't necessarily have all the answers as to why there's some speculation that, you know, head and neck uh, uh, or, or sorry, neck strength may have something to do with it. That's kind of been disproven, could have something to do with hormone fluctuations and where the injury occurs during the menstrual cycle. Uh, there could, there's, there's um, some suggestion that maybe females are more honest, more likely to report the injury. So therefore it's seen that they're taking longer to recover because they're actually still telling people they have symptoms, whereas males are, you know, lying about it. So there's all these ideas floating around. We don't truly know why females tend to take longer but it seems that across the board females take longer however this can also be mitigated 
So you obviously can't change whether you're male or female, um, but it, you can mitigate this depending on who you're seeing and what's being done. And I'm going to show you a study uh, at the end that kind of puts this whole female thing to, to rest. It might not be the fact that you're female. It might have something to do with how quickly you're in to see somebody. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, at the end. So number one was continuing to play in the same game. Number two is being female. Number three is having a pre-existing mental health condition, anxiety or depression. This is one of the strongest predictors for prolonged recovery. This has been found in high school students. It's been found in adults. Uh, things like lower resilience, uh, higher anxiety, a, even a family history, not even your own history, but a family history of depression has been found to be associated with prolonged outcomes after concussion. Um, yeah, so just like being female, you might not be able to control the family history that you have, and you might not be able to control your own history of anxiety and depression, but knowing that you have this predisposition can impact your recovery by doing the right things early on. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in a bit as well. Number four is a higher initial symptom severity score. So the higher your symptom severity is on your first visit the more likely you are to have a prolonged outcome. Now, there's some speculation that this might represent a more severe injury. However, there's some other possibilities here. So a few years ago, the international consensus statement on concussion in sport came out. This is otherwise known as the Berlin consensus statement. And here's a quote from the Berlin consensus statement. The strongest and most consistent predictor of slower recovery from sports-related concussion is the severity of a person's, person's initial symptoms in the first day or initial few days after injury. Conversely and importantly, having a low level of symptoms the first day after injury is a favorable prognostic indicator. So high symptoms, prolonged outcome, low symptoms, um, quicker outcome. The interesting thing, however, is that having a higher symptom severity score is also associated with people with increased anxiety, increased somatization, lower resilience level, and lower levels of adaptive traits or adaptability. So the question then becomes, is somebody with a higher symptom severity score early on, does that represent a more severe injury or is that kind of a warning sign that you may be dealing with somebody that has poor coping skills, increased anxiety, etc., and they are, you know, I don't want to say the word inflating, but they're coming in with higher symptom severity scores, maybe because they're a little bit more worried about the injury than somebody with these low, you know, anxiety traits, has very high coping skills, high adaptability, and they may come in with a lower uh, symptom severity score. So as a clinician, and this is one way that you can mitigate this, if I know that somebody has anxiety, if I know that somebody has a really high symptom severity score, to me, that's just indication of going, okay, I have to spend a lot of time on education and reassurance with this patient to potentially mitigate the, the, the issue of the anxiety, potentially mitigate the issue of the high symptom severity score, the coping skills, those types of things, because those are all um, uh, correlated with how in control the person feels in the situation. If you, if they feel like they have no control over the situation and they're just reading horror stories and they think that the only thing you can do is rest and do nothing and just wait for it to go away, that's a very low level of control over the situation. And if you have a very low level of control and you have increased anxiety, you're going to feel like you have no control. And that is going to be bad for everything that comes along. But if I can then take that person aside and say, this is what a concussion is. This is what's going to go on. This is how we can do things and develop a treatment plan to make sure that none of this stuff happens. We can give you the right tools right away to get you off to the right footing and the right start so that you can recover. That is super, super helpful for somebody that has anxiety. So if somebody comes in with a high symptom severity score, I don't go, oh man, this guy's doomed because the symptom severity score is high. I just know that that is also associated with these other things. That to me is something that I say, I'm gonna spend a lot of time really, really, you know, talking to this person, discussing their fears, you know, figuring out what, you know, what is there and, and trying to help them out, okay? So that's something that you can do to help mitigate that. Number five is high levels of inflammation. So concussion causes inflammation and high inflammatory markers in the blood after injury has been associated with prolonged outcomes after injury. 
So anytime there's an injury, there's going to be a level of inflammation that happens. That inflammation can lead to more inflammation. It has this kind of cyclical response to it. And so it's very easy for inflammation to turn on and it's very difficult to turn it off. Okay. So after injury, you get this inflammatory response. There's also this, this thing called the gut brain axis. So after brain injury, the permeability of your gut, meaning the gut lining actually becomes more permeable, meaning that stuff that normally isn't able to get through those barriers is now able to get through those barriers. Well, your body will see those things as foreign and it will attack them. It thinks it's some sort of pathogen and so it attacks them. That, that mounts an immune response. And so you end up with this this heightened immuno this, this this heightened immune response after injury occurs so brain injury affects gut lining so foods sometimes will cause you know gastric issues stomach upset also patients will feel foggy fatigued confused slowed down all of these things can be mediated by how much inflammatory markers are going on within their body gut lining all that type of stuff so it's very, very heavily predicated on the foods that you eat. So to mitigate that, avoiding any foods or all foods that have this pro-inflammatory effect. Alcohol, very high pro-inflammatory effect. It also increases the permeability of your gut. So if you're drinking alcohol after, that's going to potentially set things up. If you're drinking alcohol before, that's potentially going to impact things as well because you've already created this problem and now the, the concussion injury makes that issue a little bit worse. If you're eating foods that are naturally pro-inflammatory like processed foods, high amounts of sugars, uh, these types of things already irritate your gut. And if so after concussion, they can kind of compound things and make things worse. And there's actually a study here, um, or it was, it was kind of a review paper just talking about how the Western diet and the foods that we typically eat in a Western diet um, can really impact concussion recovery. And they go through all the pathways and things like that about how this can happen. So the best thing you can do to reduce inflammation, ensure that you're getting proper sleep high quality sleep, which after concussion is difficult to do, um, avoiding pro-inflammatory foods, regular exercise. And so here's the thing with concussion, which brings me to the next thing. Number six on our list of do not do's for concussion recovery is resting for too long. So everyone thinks that after concussion, you should just rest and take it easy and don't do anything and sit in a dark room. And that is actually not the case. That used to be the treatment that we would give to people, you know, 10 years ago. But the evidence now is showing that prolonged rest is not only not helpful, it actually starts to make people worse over time. Okay, so the new recommendation is not rest in a dark room and don't do anything, avoid all screens and do nothing. The new advice is actually what's called symptom limited activity meaning that you can do anything that doesn't provoke your symptoms to a significant degree. And what I mean by a significant degree is let's say a two to three point increase in your symptoms from before when you start. So let's say if your headache is a two out of 10 and then you start reading a book and all of a sudden it jumps to a five out of 10, all right, it's time to take a break. Now it doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't be reading, it just means that it's time for you to take a break on reading for now. Go for a walk, go outside, do other things, okay? So it's not sit in a dark room and do nothing anymore, all right? It's not avoiding screens. If you can handle screens, screens are fine. It's very individualized. Screens may bother some people and they're not gonna bother other people. If screens bother you, avoid them for a couple days. If they don't bother you, don't worry about it, okay? If reading bothers you, avoid it for a couple days. If it doesn't, then read, do homework, right? Now, the big thing on rest is that it should only be for the first 24 to 48 hours. And like I said, rest is no longer rest. It's symptom limited activity. You should still be going for walks. You st should still be getting outside. You don't have to sit in darkness. You don't need to wear sunglasses inside. All of this stuff is all old wives tale stuff and it actually makes you worse. I'm showing an article right now on my screen, on my notes here that says advice to rest for two for more than two days after mild traumatic brain injury is associated with delayed return to productivity. People always argue with me on this. They always say, rest, rest, rest. And they'll comment on my posts on Facebook and Instagram and stuff and say, what you should be doing is resting. No, that is not true. That is actually false. And that is going to make people worse. So 
symptom limited activity. Take it easy for a couple days and that's it. Gradually build back in to activity, okay? Number seven, ocular motor and vestibular issues. There is some mixed evidence. And what I mean by mixed evidence is some studies show no effect. Some studies show that there is an effect. Some mixed evidence that patients that have visual convergence issues, meaning how your eyes are able to, to turn in and work together, um, uh, having uh, the, uh, vestibular ocular reflex issues, having dizziness, balance impairments, those types of things are associated with prolonged recovery. The good news is, is that initiating rehab for the vestibular system as early as 10 to 14 days after injury is associated with speeding that up. So this is why getting in to see somebody that knows they're doing that says, okay, it's been a, it's been about you know seven to ten days here, and you're still having these visual issues. All right, let's start some rehab, and then let's go. And because they can do that, they can actually speed up that recovery. So just because you came in and had these ocular motor issues, if we just left you alone and didn't do anything, yeah, you would end up with those issues going on, and they would get worse over time. But if we were to say, oh, you have these ocular motor issues, let's give you some stuff to do right now to affect that. Next thing you know, you're not going to be going on to having uh, having symptoms that long. So here's a study, randomized control trial by Schneider and colleagues. This is from a few years ago. Randomized control trial means they just split the group in half randomly. Everybody was still symptomatic after 10 days. Okay, so everybody in the whole study was still having symptoms after 10 days. At the 10 day mark, they split people in half. They said, okay, you guys are going to get treatment. You guys are not going to get treatment. But they didn't tell them what they were getting. They just said, we're doing a study. Group one was just the control group. They were given basically just um, just um, uh, education uh, and reassurance and then just kind of the usual care that you would get, which means basically you're followed by you know, a sports medicine doctor or some sort of healthcare professional. I think in this case it was a sports medicine doctor, followed them, and then when they were ready to go, they discharged them. The sports medicine doctor was blinded to which group they were in as well, so the sports medicine doctor couldn't influence who was doing what. The other group, was given the same education and reassurance. They were seen by the same sports medicine doctor, but at the same time, they were also getting rehab on their neck, on their visual and vestibular systems. So this is called cervical vestibular rehabilitation, okay? After eight weeks of care, the group that was getting treatment, 73% of them had returns to full sport participation. In the group that wasn't getting treatment, only 7% had returned to full sports participation. So you can see the massive difference you can have here. So if you do a study and you say that, oh, if you have ocular motor and vestibular issues, you're going to take longer to recover. Yeah, if you don't do anything about it, you're going to take longer to recover. But if you go, if you're seeing somebody that knows they're doing and knows how to do rehab, you're going to see them and they're going to go, oh, you have ocular motor and vestibular issues. Okay, cool. Let's start some rehab on that right away, you know, within the first week or two. And you're not going to have that, right? 73% returning to full sport participation within eight weeks versus only 7% who didn't. Okay. So it's very, very important, which brings me to the final and is now starting to seem like the most important piece of the entire puzzle is number eight. How soon after injury were you in to see a trained concussion clinician? That seems to be over the past few years, there's been a number of studies, there's probably been 10 or so studies in the past few years that have looked at these variables and found that one of the best predictors of concussion recovery was how soon you were in to see a trained concussion clinician. This is presumably, right, speculative. Why this would occur is that because the person, if they know what they're doing, can give you the right advice. They're not telling you to, re like the clinician that doesn't really know anything about concussion or hasn't kept up with the emerging literature still thinks they should be telling their patients to rest. So the doctor that you see that doesn't really know much about concussion that heard about it 10 years ago says, oh yeah, concussion. So just rest in a dark room, take a week off school. Um, that's all the absolute wrong advice. And so if you're going to follow that advice, you're going to end up with the consequences of that ill-informed advice. So seeing somebody that knows what they're doing says, no, 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 no. We used to tell people to rest. We're not telling people to rest anymore. Uh, exercise. Yeah, we want you to start exercising, just light walking, that type of thing. Okay. All of that stuff reduces inflammation, reduces stress, reduces anxiety, increases control, right? Reduces all of that stuff. All right. Now, remember how I said that women take longer than men to recover? If 
those same women are in to see somebody earlier, that completely goes out the window. So there was one study that was done by Desai et al. and it was published in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine. And they had, and I'm just going to look it up here um, just so I get the right values. Where did I put it now? Where's Desai? Okay, time to presentation. Okay, so here's what they did. They had uh, adolescents, 7 to 18, and they basically looked at all their medical charts, all their information. They found that the median time to presentation for females was 15 days. For males, it was only nine days, meaning that females were able to get in, uh, or, or males were able to get in much, much sooner than females were. Then when they looked at it, they found that um, time to return to school was a median of four days for females, three days for males. Uh, average post-concussion symptom scale was 30 for females and 20 for males, so females had higher symptom severity scores. Time to return to non-contact exercise was 13 days for females and 7 days for males. So significant difference, meaning that females took longer to return than males did. However, when they compared when they came in and they said, let's control for the time to presentation. When they looked at everyone who came in within the first 7 days, male or female, all the differences between males and females completely disappeared. All right? So just because you're female doesn't necessarily mean you're behind the eight ball. It means that maybe females aren't getting care as soon as males are. And I think this has something to do, especially in the sporting world, where a lot more funding is put to males uh, sports at first. Um, and so like as soon as an injury happens in males, they're they're put right into the clinic, whereas female sports may be kind of behind, you know, we'll get them in in a week or so. That is going to dictate how well somebody can recover. So the big thing is getting in to see somebody as soon as possible that knows what they're doing, can put you on the right track, that can give you all the education you need, that can mitigate some of these things. Like I said, remember what I said at the start, 30 to 40%, typically, if we just leave people to their own, 30 to 40% of you are going to go on to have persistent symptoms. And what I mean by leave to their own, I mean if you're getting bad care too, that's the same thing. You're getting the wrong advice, inappropriate advice, and there you are. Okay. At CCMI clinics, where we have trained clinicians, less than 5% are still having symptoms beyond 30 days. And most of those are better within 6 to 8 weeks. Right. So that's just at you know 30 days, oh, they're still having a couple symptoms here and there. This isn't like a big thing. Okay. And I see people commenting on, on the live and like people are saying like, I wish I had known this information uh, a year ago. Um, yeah, that's the thing because this is why I'm doing this particular episode because most of the people that seek us out, it's after you know a few months and they realize that, hey, I'm not getting better, something's going on here. So I'm hoping that somebody will be sharing this information with people earlier on in the recovery so that they know somebody that's got a concussion today, they can say, hey, watch this. Right, go through this because this is super, super important. It's going to completely change your recovery trajectory. So, what can you do if you've had a concussion injury, or if you think you've had a concussion injury? Right? Why? How can you think you had a concussion injury? You had a mechanism of injury, meaning there was some sort of acceleration force, and you had symptoms thereafter. You only need one. If that's the case, assume you have a concussion. Now start doing the right things to get there. First, you want to rule out any red flags, meaning that you want to make sure there's no bleed or anything like that, which means you may have to go to the hospital, you may have to go see your family doctor, anything like that to rule that stuff out. Once they're confident that you don't have a bleed, now it's time to find a good rehab professional. You should try to do this within the first week so that they, a concussion trained rehab professional, good place to start, obviously, shameless plug for my own business, but completeconcussions.com, there's trained people there. Right, So if you find a clinic in your area, you can do that. If there's no clinic in your area, try to look around. Try to find somebody who's reputable, that, that has a good reputation, that treats a lot of concussions, that is up on the research, that knows this stuff, that says the same things that I'm saying to you right now. Try to find that particular person. Number two, get your diet right. Okay, Throw out anything with refined sugars. Um, even things like dairy can be pro-inflammatory for some people. Gluten can be pro-inflammatory for some people. So try to eat super, super, super clean, avoiding any type of, you know, soft drinks and things like that. Like just, you know, 
try to do super clean. This can be really helpful to find a good naturopathic doctor, a good functional medicine doctor, because they can give you the right strategies right off the hop to make sure that you're going to do everything in the right way. Number three, don't rest in a dark room. Stay somewhat active. Do light cognitive activity and light physical activity. If screens don't bother you, don't worry about screens. Okay, Anything you do that doesn't provoke symptoms to a significant degree and doesn't increase your chance for getting another concussion, you are okay to do. And just monitor your own symptoms. Ah, oh, this is kind of making me feel a little bit off. Okay, I'm going to go do something else for a bit. Okay, Keep yourself moving and active because that reduces inflammation and increases the control that you have over your own recovery. Number four, involve mental health care professionals if you know that there's a history there. If you know that you have a history of anxiety, if you know that there's a history of depression or family history of depression, if you know that you're super anxious and worried about this particular injury, seek help, right? A, you're going to get this from a good concussion clinician, but B, you may need to seek out some sort of psychotherapist, psychologist, etc. to help you to navigate this, right? These are injuries that are scary and they can create a lot of this you know fear-based thing and you're not sure what to do and so having that type of mental health support i think is going to be very very helpful in terms of your recovery and that is it